Hi, good morning. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Um, okay, so I am going to be doing a Nearpod for the first part of my presentation. Uh, I put the link in the chat um, for you all. If you could get into that for me, I'm going to be showing the student view on this screen. So um, you can just stay in the Nearpod tab and just keep your Zoom open in the background so you can hear me. Uh, that would be perfectly fine. Um, and it looks like I'm waiting on a couple more people to get into the Nearpod. Okay, Justin, don't worry. I can send you the presentation when, I, when we're done. So if you need to focus on that, you're totally good. Yeah, no worries. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. If you need the link to the Nearpod during this, just let me know. And I can drop it in the chat again. You shouldn't need a code. You should just need um, the link that I popped in the chat for you. It should take you directly there. But if it doesn't, let me know. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started if you need anything. Okay, uh, so the code... Um, is there. Okay, so you may have to, um, okay, yeah, copy the link and paste it into Google Chrome. It may not work in Explorer, and if that's the default on your computer, that's what Zoom is going to go to. Um, so try to copy the link from the Zoom chat and paste it into Google Chrome. Uh, like Adam said earlier um, in the main session, uh, the only thing Explorer is good at is getting lost, like Dora. Uh, so uh, we we like to say that um, Explorer's only uh, use is is to download Chrome. So, um, okay, perfect. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we can. Um, kind of move through everything and just start our conversation. So this is Show What You Know, Technology Tools for the World Language Classroom. All of my contact information is here if you want a screenshot. Um, it you can. Prior to this school year, and my contact information will be up again at the end. So don't worry if you didn't get it. Um, I'm Melissa Greer. Prior to this year, I taught Latin at NCCA, um, and I actually am from here. I know most of you, I think, uh, but just in case, just in case you don't, uh, but now I am a digital learning coach for the county, so I have been placed with three of the middle schools, so if you are a middle school language teacher at Indian Creek, Clements, or Liberty, um, you may see me around. I'm going to be helping you all in your buildings um, every week with technology. Uh, but I really wanted to do this session because I feel like world language teachers get lost in the shuffle sometimes. So um, I wanted to have like a dedicated space for us to be able to talk about kind of what happened over the past year and um, what are some tools and strategies that we can use in order to be successful as the county moves to one-to-one -to -one, um, for digital learning. So this is just a poll. Um, I just wanna know if you teach Spanish, Latin, French, or something else, um, just to, for me to gauge kind of where we're at. Okay, excellent. Lots of Spanish teachers. I see my Latin teachers representing all those French. Excellent. And we've got another. Perfect. Um, so 
I taught Latin. I'm going to put Latin. Okay. Um, so I am just going to go like a lightning overview of some strategies that I personally found helpful this past year as we were doing virtual learning. And then we have a collaborate discussion um, session about what y'all have found helpful. And then I can do a deep dive into one or two tools that you may want to see. And then you will have some play time to do stuff and ask questions if you have them. So without further ado, the first thing that I have found helpful is Flipgrid. So uh, you heard in the main session probably or saw in the chat, we were um, promoting our Flipgrid challenge for T4T. Uh, and it's a way for people, specifically students, to share videos of themselves to show what they know. So we, students can create videos to explain something, whether it's about grammar or culture or history, um, or they can practice using the target language in a video and then it is sent to you. Uh, a couple of features that I really liked about Flipgrid are that you can set the videos to be moderated. So you have to approve them for other people to see, like other people in the class to see. So you have to go over them before everyone else can see them just to make sure everything is, you know, on the up and up, which is really nice. Or if students don't want their video shared, you don't have to share it out with the whole class. So that's really nice. And then uh, I also like the fact that you as the teacher and students can leave video responses to others. Uh, and teachers can also leave written feedback. I'm not sure students can leave written feedback, uh, but that uh, two-way communication is, is really good for a world language classroom. The second thing that I found helpful, oh, I wanna know if you have used Flipgrid with your classes. Okay. Okay. We have a lot of nevers. That's really interesting. Um, so if you uh, have time this afternoon, I would encourage you to go to a session on Flipgrid just to see how it can be used. If we want to deep dive into that in a few minutes, let me know. Uh, but I have found it really useful to have students practice when they have to present things. They practice in the video and upload it and I can give them feedback before they have to present like in front of the whole class or I use it instead of a whole class presentation and just share the videos with everyone so they can all see, but so it doesn't take a whole day because they can all film at the same time. Um, okay. So the next thing that I personally have found useful is Pear Deck. So I know that Alcovi had pro accounts this past year um, I do not know if they have them this year, but if you do, I would encourage you to look into it. Uh, Pear Deck is kind of like Nearpod, so kind of like what we're doing now where you can build activities into presentations. But with Pear Deck, instead of it being a separate slide for the activity, it is embedded onto your slide. So there are a couple of different features in Pear Deck that I like um, that Nearpod doesn't have. So you can have them drag little icons to different places on, on the screen of on your slide. So I would have a sentence right now. And um, when we were talking about accusatives, I could have them drag the, um, like the little icon, whatever it was, maybe a trophy, maybe a check mark, whatever it was, on top of the accusative, which is mostly our direct object for when we were learning that. So um, drag the star to the direct object. And they could do that and I could quickly see who was getting it, who wasn't getting it. And then we could uh, talk about it and then move on. Pear Deck also allows you to do um, teacher pace lessons. So like what we're doing now in Nearpod. It also lets you do uh, student pace lessons, which Nearpod does as well, where you can um, just assign it to the students, they go through it at their own pace, and then you can look at it later and give the students feedback. 
Um, okay, so Nearpod, that's what we're using now. So it does convert your slides into interactive lessons. There are tons of activities that you can build in um, for student engagement. So this um, particular presentation that we're doing right now has a lot of polls in it. You can embed videos, you can embed websites. So instead of students having to type in a URL, go to a website that you want them to look at, just build it into your presentation, it automatically takes them there. Um, when you get to that slide, you can embed, they have this game called Time to Climb and you just build questions in, so it's like a little quiz, but it's got these cute little characters and they're climbing up a mountain uh, and the, the, the person who gets to the top first wins. Um, the mechanics are kind of like Kahoot or Quizlet if you are familiar with those. Um, it also has very robust reporting functions. So you can dig down like really far into what your students are understanding and what they're not understanding. And then you can also use that to put in the grade book if you wanted to. You can create your presentations within Nearpod or you can upload pre-made presentations. So you can do them in PowerPoint and then upload them to Nearpod and then just insert the activities. Um, you can also create your slides in Google. I created these slides in Google and there's an add-on where you insert the activities into your Google Slides presentation and then you just click to present it through Nearpod and here we are. Um, you do this year, uh, if you heard in the main session, you do have a uh, pro code this year. So uh, everyone in Newton County has a pro account for Nearpod. And uh, I would encourage you to learn how to use this because you can build lessons. If you want to have a, like a, more of an asynchronous day, you can do a student paced lesson and they can go through it at their own speed. Or I don't know, if we have snow and we have to do a digital learning day, you can have a Nearpod where you are presenting and every student has their own version of it on their own device as well. It's also helpful when, like if your projector bulb dies and it's a special projector, so they have to wait two or three weeks to get a bulb in. You don't have to worry about not having that projector because you're projecting onto every student's individual device with Nearpod, um, which is really Great. Um, so I want to see if any of you guys have used Nearpod before. So just all the time, a few times, or never. Okay, lots of never again. That's perfectly fine. Maybe a couple of us have used it a few times. Let's see what this does. Oh, excellent. So you guys get a pie chart. So you can share results from polls to the student devices as well, which is super helpful. And then I can unshare those um, when I'm done. Uh, ooh, the next thing is Edpuzzle. I love Edpuzzle. Uh, Edpuzzle allows you to take videos either that you've created, that you found on YouTube or Khan Academy, or videos that are already created in Edpuzzle add questions into the middle of them, and then assign it to students. I really like the fact that through Edpuzzle, you can set it to where the students cannot skip and they have to watch the entire video. So they can't just click to where the next question is, answer the question, click to the next question, and not watch any of the content that's happening. Uh, so Edpuzzle has been really great for that. It also integrates seamlessly with Canvas for grades. So there is a um, add-on for Canvas that you can get for Edpuzzle and you just assign them directly through Canvas as an assignment uh, and it grades it automatically, puts it in the Canvas gradebook and then if you use grade, gradebook passback or grade sync to push your grades back into Infinite Campus, it's done. You don't have to worry about it. Like you don't have to worry about grading anything because it already does it for you. Um, if you are at NCCA, I know we had pro account last year for Edpuzzle. I do not know if Mr. Walker is paying for them, but you can ask. If you um, don't, there, there's a limited free account. So you can have a certain amount of videos active in your account with questions for free. Uh, and for, I know for Latin, there are a lot of videos already created that teachers have already put questions in. So you just 
you can copy that. Like you can use other people's work and you just need to preview the questions before you assign it to your kids and then boom, you're ready to go. So this was a great way to make watching instructional videos a little bit more interactive for students um, because they have to answer those questions in order for the video to continue. Um, the next thing is Quizlet. Most of us probably already know about Quizlet. So flashcards, review activities, great for vocabulary. Um, and they also have Quizlet Live so you can play as a game in your classroom. I like that you can add audio to cards so students can hear the correct pronunciation of words. Um, and we, there is a limited free account. So there is a way to get a pro subscription to get more features. Uh, I had a teacher Quizlet account last year, and it was really useful for keeping track of progress. So you can see, oh, Susie Q um, went all the way through the flashcards for this chapter two days ago. And then she also played this game for 20 minutes. And uh, so you can see how much they're doing. So when they don't do well in a vocab quiz, you can look at their progress. And you can say, hey, I saw that you didn't study very much. Uh, maybe if we get this up, if you practice more, if you interact with the words more, um, your vocab quizzes will be better. So um, Quizlet was super useful. I also really like using Canva. So um, Canva is uh, kind of like, I guess, kind of like Microsoft Publisher, but way, way better. And it's cloud-based, so it's all on the internet. And you can create beautiful in infographics, flyers, newsletters, social media posts, uh, posters for your classroom, all kinds of stuff. Um, you can also create classes and share templates to students for them to be able to fill them in. Um, pro accounts are free for teachers. So I highly recommend that you do that because the templates that they have are amazing. And all of the elements like the clip art and, and um uh, little interactive sticker things are just, they're just amazing. So highly recommend that. Very beautiful, very user-friendly. Um, cannot recommend Canva enough. I use it at least once a week. Um, and then Google Assignments in Canvas. So it this is uh, an add-on to Canvas assignments that allows you to use a Google Doc, a sheet, or slides as a template that pushes out into everyone's Canvas account, and it lets all of your students complete an individual copy of that document and then turn it in in Canvas so then you can grade it and give feedback in the speed grader. So you're not having to open 18 million like Google Drive files and then hop between those windows back to Canvas to put the grades in or back to Infinite Campus to put the grades in. You're just doing everything through speed grader in Canvas, which is amazing. Um, and then um, my, my big trick with that is that for worksheets that I already have and used to use, instead of printing them out for the kids to do on paper, you can um, save like a PDF of it as an image instead of the PDF file, insert that into the background of a Google slide, and then um, students can just insert text boxes into the blanks or whatever to then complete the worksheet and then turn that in. So it turns a worksheet into a fully digital um, interactive um, thing instead of having to worry about like if you have enough copies or if you got your copy requested in time and any of that. So that's another thing that we can definitely do a deep dive into how to do that um, in a couple of minutes. But I do want to know if any of you have used this feature. So if you have used the Google Assignments LTI in Canvas, um, all the time, a few times or never, just let me know and we'll see what we have going on. Ooh, okay. Okay, lots of never again, perfectly fine. A lot of these tools I had to discover by myself. So um, I'm glad that um, we have the opportunity to talk about these things. Um, so that maybe it can make your lives a little bit easier. Next thing, Google Sites. So with our um, Google accounts, we can make Google Sites. The students can as well. 
So you can create them to house material or to create like choose your own adventure type of activity, or you can have your students make Google sites to show their learning. So um, they can, I don't know, make a website about a country or a specific festival or just all kinds of things they can do, or they can make a, a Google site that's a repository of all of their grammar items. They can do all kinds of things with Google sites. So one thing that I do like about Google sites is that your design elements are limited. So you can only change it so much. So once you pick your color theme, you've got like three shades of that color to work with and you, you can't really go outside of that. It also moderates kind of how big the text is for the most part. Um, so students have to spend more time focusing on the content rather than making things pretty because those options are limited for them, um, which is really nice. So instead of like spending three days trying to find a font for their title, they've got, you know, that done in two minutes and then they can move on to the actual learning. Um, we also have Google Voice. So I have um, set up a Google Voice summer so that my students and my parents can contact me uh, and so that they don't have my real phone number, uh, which is important because I'm not trying, because I, I can turn off my notifications for Google Voice and not have to worry about it. So when I went to the beach, turned it off and it didn't matter. But when I'm back in session, my Google Voice number is there so that I could call parents to be like, hey, I need you to get your kid because you failed the test. Or um, students could do a quick text like, hey, having trouble with this number on the homework, they could text me a, a picture of it and then I was able to easily respond. Uh, and that was really, really helpful. Um, another thing you can do with Google Voice is that students can call your Google Voice number and leave voice messages in your target language so that you don't have to spend all day on a pronunciation quiz, listening to every kid do it individually one after another. They can all do it at the same time on their phone. They just call you, they leave a voicemail, and then you can grade them at your leisure um, by just listening to your voicemail. It also will transcribe it for you um, if they talk clearly. And I believe they do transcribe in Spanish. They probably transcribe in French, probably not in Latin, um, but there are transcription options available in Google Voice. But you, so with our county Google accounts, we do not have access to Google Voice. So you have to make a personal Google account to do this from. So I just made one, um, like a, a Gmail that's Maggie Shagreer, Teacher Greer, um, to create that with. So it's kind of just like a junk email um, that I created that number with. Um, and then lastly, book creator. So you can create books for your students to read through, um, or you can create books, or students can create books to show their learning about whatever it is. Uh, you can also share templates that you want your students to fill in that are like books. Uh, and they can also be shared as eBooks, so EPUB files, or downloaded as PDFs. They can be shared through a link through the internet um, to parents and stuff. And the ways, students have so many different modes in order to show their learning and add content to the book. So they can type, they can draw, they can insert images, they can record audio, they can record video, all kinds of stuff in order to be able to show what they know. Um, and we have free pro accounts uh, for that through Newton County School System as well. So you can access that through Launchpad. And that's another thing we can deep dive into. Uh, but before we do that, have any of you guys used Book Creator before? Okay, so this is what we're looking like. I really like Book Creator too because when the students want to insert images, they can search through a, a catalog of images that are labeled for reuse. So they don't have to, you don't have to worry about like, oh, my kids are illegally using images that belong to someone else. It automatically only lets them choose images that are labeled for reuse that they can use. Okay, it is collaborate time. 
Okay, so uh, this is a Collaborate board. So um, in the text box, uh, I would like for you to share what other digital tools you personally have found helpful for your world language classroom and what other ways you may have used the tools we talked about um, if you've used any of them. And then you can heart submissions if you agree with them or if you also use them. Okay, it looks like we've got a bunch of things coming in. Thank you for those of you who are submitting things. I've heard of most of these. Um, oh yeah, so when we are in person using the active board as a station for them to do like matching games, that's excellent. But quizzes a couple times, Kahoot. I'm assuming digital dialects like let you listen to different um, dialects of this of different or the same languages. I think that's really awesome that that there's a resource for that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Okay, so what two things? Would you like me to actually show you how to use? And you can select more than one thing. So you can select two things. Okay, just to show you guys. So um, it looks like we're going to do Google Assignments, LTI, and Canvas, and then Canva. So if you will come back to the Zoom so that you can see my screen. Um, I'm going to quickly go through uh, and show you guys how to use um, these two things. And okay, and I, if I may go a little fast, but I can create a tutorial for you guys. And when I download the Zoom report uh, for who came to the session, I will um, send that tutorial for how to do this to you. So first I want to show you what these assignments look like for the, well, just what they look like in Canvas. And then I will show you how to um, make them. So, think 
Yes. Okay. In Canvas, this is what uh, will pop up after you have created and assigned your Google assignment to your students. When you set it up, you, of course, set up how many points it is when it's due, all that jazz. And then you attach the file that you want them to the complete. And then the kids turn them in. And then to grade them, you just click on one. And then it automatically opens up a new tab for you. And this kid, I let them, as long as I can figure out where the answers are, doesn't matter to me where they put them. So this kid made a new slide and put the answers um, in the new slide and he just added a text box. All the answers to all of the questions are there. And then I would type a grade in here and hit return to return that paper to the student. And then that grade would automatically go into my Canvas grade book. Um, so that's really how easy it is to grade them. But to create them, um, you are going to first create your template. So I need to find... A well, let's okay. So, I like to create mine if I already have the worksheet in Google Slides, so then I don't have to retype all of the questions, I just have to insert an image of the worksheet. So, I first go to File and then Page Setup. Nope, yes, and then if you click on the where it says widescreen and you click on custom. Uh, then I usually resize it to eight and a half by 11 because that's what the worksheets usually are formatted, at, formatted as. And then I just delete all the text boxes. And then I need to go grab a worksheet really quickly. I'm on a new computer, so I don't have any of my worksheets on here anymore. Perfect. Excellent, okay, so download. And then I'm going to come back over here. Uh, actually, just open weirdly. So normally I would open this up in Adobe um, and then just save it as an image which I, you can't see on my screen right now, but that's what I'm doing. So you just need an image instead of a PDF file. So you can either uh, just take a picture or scan it in as an image, or you can convert it to an image using, like if you Google PDF to PNG or JPEG converter, it will, um, allow you to save it as a different type of image. So normally I save things as PNG. They tend to do better for me. So then in your slide, in order to insert your worksheet as the background, you just click on background here in the middle of the screen. And then instead of changing the background color, you're gonna choose an image and you're gonna upload because it's on your computer. So you'll just browse for it like, like you would any sort of file. You select your image and hit open. Uh, of course, an error occurred. See if it'll Well, excellent. This isn't working. Um, 
So you just upload it and it automatically puts it in the background. So I'm going to put this in there, see if it'll work. Okay. So this is just a random picture, but if this was a picture of a worksheet, it would be here. And then if there were things that you want them to circle, usually what I do is I go ahead and just create a shape for them and then make the, the fill color transparent so that these circles are already there for them. So then all they have to do is click it and drag it over the thing that needs to be circled. And then for if they're answering questions and need to like fill in blanks, usually what I'll do is I will go ahead and create a text box for them. And then uh, I will, in the text box, I will just type double click to type because if they double click it, they can then start typing and it will replace the text for them and allow them to fill in that blank. And then you'll just need to make sure that you name it, you know, something that is related to the worksheet title. And then you go back over to Canvas after you've created your worksheet. And you go and you just create an assignment like you normally would. So you go to Assignments plus Assignment. And again, I can make a tutorial with like step-by-step -step instructions in a video and PDF format for you um, for later. Um, especially if you can't get into Canvas right now. Message to students with directions, maybe if you if you need more directions than what's already in your Google slide. Um, your point values. If you have assignment groups, put them do what you want with that, how many points it is. And then under submission type, you're going to do external tool. And when that happens, you get this, and it's going to ask you for the external tool URL. And you don't know that off the top of your head. I don't know that off the top of my head. So I'm going to click find. And then you scroll until you see Google Assignments LTI 1.3, not Google Drive Cloud Assignments. You just want Google Assignments and then LTI. And then you link your account. And then you have to find your file. So it defaults to your recent things because theoretically you were working on that worksheet last. And then you just click on it and hit add. And boom, each student is going to get a copy of this. You put how many points it is, the due date, if you want to make a rubric, you can create a rubric or import a rubric from Google Sheets if you have one in there. And then you create it. Oh, you didn't see any of that, did you? Oh, I don't know if you saw that. Does it open up in a new window? Um, but you just follow the prompts. It's super, super easy. Follow the prompts to attach your assignment. It's already so it's not gonna let me do that again. And then and then it fills in the URL. So it's assignments.google.com, blah blah blah. And then you finish filling out the Canvas assignment. So however many attempts you want them to have, if you want it to go ahead and sync with Canvas, I mean with Infinite Campus when you grade it, and then who you want to assign it to. Um, so I'm going to assign it to that section. I'm not going to put a due date on there. For Infinite Campus, if you're using Grade Pass Fact to pass your grades from Canvas to Infinite Campus, you have to have a due date and an available from date but not an until date. So do an available from, and then you just save and publish. I'm just gonna save it. 
because I don't want my former students to freak out. And then that's all you gotta do. And it pops up. Once the kids uh, work on it, they will populate here. And it's as easy um, as I showed you earlier to, to grade them and then you're done. So instead of having them have to do um, paper worksheets, you can just convert them um, into uh, these Google assignments, which is super fun. Uh, okay, so the next thing you guys wanted to see a little bit of was Canva. And it's just canva.com. It's logging me in. Perfect. So um, it start, this is the homepage for Canva. You can do all kinds of things with Canva. I really like making infographics and presentations just because the um, elements that you can use are just are just so pretty. So if you scroll down, you can also find other things. So in education, they have trending templates that people have created. Um, so these are whatever a wiser worksheet is. Let's see if we can find one about language. That's English, I guess. So if you go to these templates, they should be pretty much fully editable. So this is a worksheet that's a template on Canva and I can change this if I wanted to. It gets fully editable, you can change the directions. If I'm just not a yellow fan, you can change the colors. Do this weird pink color. Um, and then even inside the pictures or the elements, you can change the colors. So if I'm just for real not a yellow fan, you can change that to blue. And there we go. And you can edit everything. So these sentences I can change. Um, I can add pages if I want to. Um, if you want to add another template that you see, you can add it as a new page or convert whatever you have going on to that. If I want to add more elements, so the different kinds of elements they have, um, you can search for anything, but then they also have lines and shapes, different kinds of graphics. You can pick from photos, videos you can embed. There's different sounds you can embed. The frames are cool. Because if you drag a picture over them, it automatically like fits into that shape, which is super cool. But if I want to search for a pinata, it's got all of these different elements that I could just boom embed into my into my presentation. So I want this cute little guy. And you can move him around. If I want him in front, I can put him there, resize him, all kinds of fun stuff. You can also share these files, which is super important. So when you share, you can create a class. When you create a class that allows you to share this template out to students who then will complete it, and then you can see their completed work. Um, and then you can also send a, a, a link to like other teachers if you want them to be able to edit this file or you share it to your class if you want it um, to be viewed by them so that they could make a copy to edit their own copy of it or to where they would edit your copy, which probably is not going to be what you want to do. You can download uh, anything you create in Canva as all these different file types. So all kinds of fun stuff. I My go-tos usually are the PNG and the PDF print. Um, just because even if I'm not printing it out, if I'm just having it as a digital file, 
uh, the PDF print is a larger file size and a little bit higher quality than PDF standard. Um, and then you can also, you know, change these things. You can compress it to make it a lower quality if you need a smaller file um, and fun stuff like that. And you can also publish it. So you can um, create an assignment for your class and then you would assign it to your class or your specific student in your class through those three little dots. Um, if you, we, we all have Remind this year, so you can push it out directly through Remind to all of your students. So you can make a classroom newsletter and send it out to Remind to all of your students and all of your parents. Um, for Canva, I have not seen limitations with the copyright. So as far as I know, anything in your account in Canva that you're able to use, you can use it freely however you want to, um, because if you, so if you sign up with your teacher email, you have um, a, like a pro educator account and then yeah, no worries. But if you sign up with a personal email and don't say that you're an educator, you get like the Canva free account uh, and lots of these elements would be watermarked. So you'll see this little pinata here, this guy he's labeled as free. But then the guy that we inserted has a little grad cap, the mortarboard, and it says EDU, which means that as, a, as an educator, you're able to use that. But if just like, you know, Joe Schmo out on the sidewalk wanted to create a Canva account, he would have to pay to use this image without a watermark if he didn't want the watermark. Um, you can also share a link directly to it. You can present it. Uh, you can tweet it directly from Canva. Uh, and then you can also, they, they have a deal with like printers where you can get these things professionally printed onto all kinds of stuff. If you want a t-shirt with whatever your kids designed, then it will do it, make you a t-shirt. Of course, you'll have to pay for the t-shirt, but um, you can do all kinds of stuff with Canva. Let me show you some stuff that I have done. Um, so at NCCA last year, we had a uh, family throwdown, which is where we would all come together on Zoom. So this is a recipe card that I made. Um, this I posted on my teacher Instagram for my students. So um, this started out as a template of like how to factor, I think. Yeah, factor out the whatever GCF means, greatest common factor. I don't know. Um, but I changed it into, I edited this template into this so that students would have like the formula to figure out what they needed to make on the final in order to get a certain grade in the class. Um, let's see. Recipe cards. This was a, like a seminar that I did for the STEM students. So I made an infographic for them on how to ask for a recommendation letter from a teacher. So this actually started out as this template over here about how to make strong passwords for your accounts. But you can see I fully edited it and changed it in order to serve my purpose. So Canva is super great and it's, I couldn't draw those things by myself. Like I wouldn't be able to create this on my own in like Google Docs or something without just like the clean elements that Canva has. So it's super great. 